Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, we're uh, joined by John Ilsley, who was the basis for Dire Straits all the way through the only person who was all the way through other than Mark. And it's funny because I was thinking, it was 1978 and I was listening to my radio station in Florida and uh, the DJ came on and said, well, here's a new one for, for you. It's from a band called Dire Straits. And after you hear it, could you give me a call and tell me, you know, who did you think this sounded like? And then Sultans of Swing came on and I, uh, I it was like, it's like a shiver. And I had never, ever heard anything like it. But then I thought, oh, I'll, I'll call the radio station anyway. So I did, and amazingly, which never happens, I got through. And the DJ goes, so what did you think? Who did it sound like to you? And I went, uh, uh, it didn't sound like <laughs> anything I've ever heard in my life. And he, he hung up on me and took the next call. Um, so welcome, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for the invitation. So I guess the first question most people will think about, and the book's been out a bit, but what made you at this time, um, you know, both of us are of a certain age, what made you at this time decide, let's put this down on paper. And also I should tell everyone it's an audio book uh, with, it's introduced by Mark Knopfler, um, who's a great friend of yours. And they also, you should watch Guitar Stories on YouTube, which is your walk down memory lane with him and, and Mark's best, his favorite six guitars. It's, it's a wonderful show to watch. But, um, and he, he does a great forward. But then uh, you have a lovely reading voice and it was a pleasure reading the book, listening to the book. But um, what, gave, what gave rise to the impetus that said, okay, I think I'll write a book about my 20 years, 25 years with uh, Dire Straits. Uh, well, I hadn't really thought about writing a book, Sam, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, a couple of two, three, couple of years ago, I was doing these shows, um, quite intimate shows in the UK, just acoustically with a few band members and my one of my ex-managers. And we were chatting about the, um, the, the history of Dire Straits because I thought it would be quite a nice thing to take on the road. You know, play a few songs, have a chat about Wild West End and Salt to Swing, play another song, play Lady Writer, chat about that. And it really went down very well. And I didn't realize at the time that sitting in the audience uh, on one of these gigs was a agent for writers, a writing agent, um, and it turned out quite a big one. And by complete coincidence, I bumped into her two weeks after these gigs we played at a charity event and she was sitting next to me this is another coincidence in life there's lots of them but uh and she said to, she turned to me and said have you thought about writing a book and i said well that's a very strange i haven't met you before that's a very strange question to ask me uh and she said well i'm a i'm a, a a writing agent and i think you should write this down because i came to watch the show and it was so interesting to get that background um from this from one of the main sources of the band and it it sort of um she said i think this will make a really good book and um i went oh look you know i'm not a writer i write songs but you know writing a book that's a different deal altogether anyway she said well here's my card if you if you change your mind come and see me and we can chat through it and we can get some uh we can get somebody to help you to you know put it together so anyway then we had um, lockdown. I don't think everybody remembers that, the COVID moment. And um, so uh, I thought about it and she she rang me two or three times and I said, I'm still thinking. And in the end, I, I, I said, OK, I'll do it. And with the help of a, a very old friend of mine who was actually was a professional um, uh, you know, writer that helped people to put their stories together, um you know we, we began this process of putting together this document if you like and for me a celebration of um my life in this band and, and, and everybody else connected to it who i thought needed uh some kind of acknowledgement 
apart from Mark, of course. <laughs> but along with all the other musicians, the caterers, the lorry drivers, the promoters, the guy that hangs from the ceiling with the spotlight, all these people who make the machine work on a band that size. And it took me a long time because I thought I hadn't remembered anything. But when I started to write it down, you know, I, it just started to flow. And lockdown was the perfect moment because there really wasn't much else to do, to be frank. Yeah, but it actually, you know, at first I thought, well, you know, people, a lot of people don't remember a lot of things that happened in those times, but it was almost photographic. And like you said, you give credit to pretty much everybody in the crew and all the people you met throughout, including famous celebrities, great yeah. musicians, especially Keith Moon, that one situation. But there's so many questions I could ask you. I, I would almost, it's almost easier if you could tell me exactly what you want to talk about. But, but one of the, I guess we should start, maybe we should start in Deptford, or maybe we should start when you saw Mark lying on his back with the guitar over his chest. But why don't you give it a go as to where you'd like to begin with the beginning of the band? Well, the beginning really um, was another coincidence. I, you know, my life seems to be full of them. And I'm a firm believer in you get these moments in life when you have to make a choice about um, going in one direction or another direction. And in my very early 20s, I had to make a few decisions about the rest of my life, but like most people do. Uh, there comes a sort of critical time when you have to think, okay, what A, what am I good at? B, what do I want to do? C, do I think I can do it? And, uh, you know, B, do I have the energy to do it for a start? And um, so I was living in this flat in Deptford, um, which was basic in the extreme. I won't go into the details, but some people called it a squat. And it really wasn't far off that because A, I didn't have a, a, a bean to, to my name. And I was living on sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of the money from the university because I went to college when I was in when I was 24, which is very late um, because I mucked up all my exams when I was younger because I was playing the guitar all the time. And um, despite the fact that my housemaster used to take them off me every time I played them. But anyway, so that's another story altogether. But so I ended up with this council flat in, in South London, which is really basic. And I needed somebody to help with the rent, which was at that point in time in dollars was probably about 10 bucks a week. Right. And I couldn't afford it uh, and drink beer. So I had to get a council, uh, a, a, a mate to come and join me in this council flat. And a friend of a friend said this chap was a so local, local social worker, needs a place. And that was David Knopfler. And David arrived carrying a guitar. And I thought, I think we might get on here, he and I, which we did. And he became a great friend. And then, of course, Mark turned up, um, you know, a few weeks later. Um, and we just became uh, connected quite quickly, actually. I, I just thought to myself, I've got a feeling I'm going to know this chap for a long time. And I didn't realize it was going to be 50, something 50 odd years. Yeah, that's what we were anyway. talking about before. So that's the bare yes. bones of how it all got together. A series of coincidences. I packed in my job, went to university, moved into the council flat, uh, which was a big move to stop a very successful job and go to university again and go back to being a student. And then, then I met the people that were going to make my life come together and theirs of course yeah one of the things i thought of when i when i listened to you was that you know my father always said you make your own luck and i thought yeah yes. you're right life is exactly chance right. but exactly if you're right. laying on the floor an opportunity knocks at your door and you're too lazy to get up and answer the door yeah you're not going to exactly. be in dire straits yeah yeah well that's it you see i mean uh you know some people would take the safe road but um as my everybody knows me, I don't really ever take that road. I always take something that's going to be a little chancy. Um, and, then, and then your and then your parents are not exactly pleased with those chances. Oh my god, no! They were they were slightly panicking because uh, you know I was always like I hate to use the expression "black sheep of the family," but I really wasn't. Uh, I don't think I was uh, the favourite uh, child, or they'll probably deny that, but. Um, um, we, there were four of us and I was I think I was the sort of a bit of an afterthought 
but we better not go into that one. Uh, but anyway, so you know, you're quite right. You make your own. Uh, I don't. You make your own life. I wouldn't call it luck, but you make your own way in life. And sometimes it might be a mistake, and you just have to go. Okay, well, that didn't work, but I'm still going to, you know, take the odd chance in order to move forward. Yeah, I was just thinking when you're talking about black sheep, two things. One, how everyone in the book you treat so kindly, even the situation between David and Mark. There's not a bad word you say about anything that happened there. But I was thinking about how nice your brother was to you, especially the fact that he actually made a bass guitar for you. <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? I, saw, I wish I'd had that thing still, but... Uh, it got lost in the in the move from one place to another. I can't remember really, but yes, I mean, I you know, I didn't really, I didn't really see myself as being a bass player. To be honest, I I, I wanted like everybody else wanted to be a guitar player, but I really, as you can see, I've got the hands of a bass player. So as it turns out, and um, as soon as I started playing it, I thought, this is me. Simple as I didn't, I didn't have to look any further. This was the way that I was going to interpret music so i think when i hear music the first thing i listen to actually is the bass and see if that's working properly the other thing for people of a certain age like us is you know every reference because you were right you and i are in the same wheelhouse i mean when you talk about joe cocker and then jeff beck and then even family which is Rick Gretsch on bass, and then he was yeah. in Blind Faith. I saw Blind Faith on their only tour of the United States, and then, wow. uh, and then uh, uh, the White Album, and then Richard Thompson, who played. My brother saw him in uh, Royal Albert Hall for his seventieth birthday. He's older than us. And then um, Ian Drury and the Blockheads. Who would think that I would hear that again and hit me with your rhythm stick? <laughs> But well, that was one of the most fun part of the books was all the people that you revere are the same ones I did too. Yes. I, well, there's there's just sort of fairly major moments, I think, uh, that are created by certain people um, by chance or by, uh, in, you know, intention. We don't know, but it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is there are certain people who who move you and, uh, touch you in a way that somebody else doesn't touch you and and that goes for writing a reading a book looking at a painting listening to music uh you know it, it, they're all in the same it, it, there's a sort of an emotional element which i find very very important in all aspects of my artistic life if you like you know with painting and with and with music and with theater and with reading a book you know I, in some books, I just start them, and after about fifteen pages, they go, "This is just not for me." And other things just just grab me, and I just I'm off, you know, and I yep. just run with it. And I think that's probably the same for a lot of people. But you know, you're right. These people, I mean, Richard Thompson, you know, Rick Gretsch, you know, Stevie Winwood. I grew up with all this lot, and you know, they're only about two or three years older than me. My God, they started young. Um, yeah, Stevie Winwood. Yeah, and I've, I've you know I've followed Eric, you know, Clapton all his life, pretty much, and. And 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 uh, dear Jeff and um, Jeff Beck and people like that and you know going to see the very first group you know the the faces was called you know with uh, Ronnie Wood on bass and and uh, you know um, Rod Stewart singing and fantastic moments. Yeah, really like Itchy, Coo Itchy Coo Park. It, it's funny because Mark, without ego, all, when they people talk to him, he always says the reason why he still plays these songs and you do too. Uh, and my son listens to those, you singing Sultans of Swing, um, is because Mark says the, these songs are milestones in people's yeah. lives. Yeah. And that's why he still thinks he, kind of, not a duty, but he feels like it's, it's, a, it's, as you say, he feels it's a gift from the people rather than him giving to them. Yes, he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, if you manage to write something which somebody else likes, even if it's one person or a million people, you've kind of achieved something. If it's a million people, obviously that's that's a, that's an absolute bonus. It doesn't happen very often. And I don't really think that when Salt the Swing, Swing was written, uh, just as, as an example, I don't think that was, we weren't going, oh, this is going to be a hit. We, we had no idea at all. And in fact, actually, I'll tell you a little story. I can't remember whether I put this in the book or not. 
But when it first came out in the UK, Sultans, you know, we had a little bit of a following in the clubs and the pubs and such like. But that was about all. And it was sent to the BBC. And the BBC said, oh, we can't play this. There's too many words in it. And and <laughs> so I only found this out later. And so they didn't play it. And so that's why it was a hit in America before it was a hit uh, before it was in England. And it was a hit almost all the way around the world. And then the BBC, God bless them, you know, in their stuffy, you know, 1970s, uh, you know, moments, uh, decide, in the end decided to play it. And, of course, it became a hit. And uh, with all those words in it as well, you know. Well, I, the, the great story is how you guys came back to go to the pub and you didn't know that you were popular, but everyone started applauding as you walked into the pub. And you yeah, had no, no idea. that was pretty weird. Well, you you know, you, we just gave the tape to Charlie Gillett because he, I, I kind of knew him through a record shop that I'd started. And Charlie just said, oh, well, I, I, you know, I'll listen to it. He didn't say he was going to play it. That's for certain. He said, I'll listen to it and I'll give you a call. And then we said, oh, great. Thanks, Charlie, and walked away. And then that was on the Thursday. On the Sunday morning on his radio show, he played it and we were... I think Mark and I were shifting some furniture for some friends to make some money, you know. Uh, then we went in the pub that night, as you say, and everybody went, you're on the bloody radio. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, and the, and the thing about it is, is that, yes, he was a great person for you. And, the, and as you yeah. said, all about so lovely and so kind and so gracious. But then again, all these chance moments, the fact that your yeah. aunt died and you got 500 quid, that would that's it i mean but for that you wouldn't have been able to make your demo tape well no the fact of the matter is and i tell you what 500 quid was a lot of money there because we, we were literally not living on bread and water but you know one meal a day and a couple of pints that's about all we could afford and uh so that 500 quid was a considerable amount of money if you think about it in 1976 or something 77 you know, that would be probably 5,000 quid now. And yeah. that money, as you rightly say, was used to make a demo tape. And, um, uh, you know, some people say that that version of Sultans is on that on that demo tape is, is still the best one. I, I don't know. I, I, I've got no real kind of opinions about it, you know, but because um, there's several versions of that now. But um, the thing is, Charlie spotted, Charlie Gillett spotted that song, which we didn't really you know we said it's a good song and it, it felt good to play but you know we did we had no idea we've never been very good at singles actually that's all i can say we don't know we never know what's going to sort of jump out at people we rather let the record companies decide on what they wanted to play because they kind of know what the what the public want apparently what well, if you think about it think of telegraph road who would yeah. think? Who would think that anyone would even accept it? It starts so slow, and even though the the middle, the crescendo, if you will, is amazing, it's a very long song, a long format, and it starts yeah. so softly that you yeah. wouldn't think it would be such a wonderful, wonderful song. Well, the thing about Mark's writing, uh, Sam, is the fact that he's able to um, create an atmosphere, create a story. Um, which really um, has a strong uh, foundation to it. You know, he, he you know, he's a, he was an English teacher, so he's got a very, very good use of language, obviously. But also, he's he's very observant, and I think that that's the essence of a good songwriter: is seeing something and being able to put it down so somebody else gets it. And Telegraph Road you know, is a, it was a momentous bit of writing and also a momentous bit of playing and recording. It was quite an, quite an epic moment as well, because uh, it's, as you say, it's 14 minutes long. And when you're playing it live, you don't even think about it because it's just like two songs joined together. But when you're in the studio and you've got to keep that, that energy at a certain uh, value and level uh, for 14 minutes, it's it's pretty it's pretty difficult. Oh, that, that's a good jumping off point for not only the studio in the Bahamas, but also the fact we should talk about the evolution of the band and David. You know yeah. how you start out these four guys, and all of a sudden you're adding keyboards, you're adding computers, yeah. and the first band to do that, the first band 
to have a compact disc that sold a million copies. Yeah, well, I think we just we just happened to be there when the te technology was uh, was being developed, and uh, it, it, well, at the time, of course, it was a remarkable moment. Uh, uh, the record company was probably rubbing their hands in glee the fact that everybody had bought the cassettes and the and the LP and now they had to buy the cassette the uh, the CD as well so I mean there was a bit of a sort of financial element to it but no I mean CDs really transformed um, the way people listen to music for a while in the same way that Spotify's done the same thing now um, transform music in a certain kind of way beyond what we could have even dreamt of but um, I mean that was just a we just happened to be at that there at that moment. The same with MTV was just starting. It was in America, I think, in in eighty four, but it didn't come to the UK until eighty five, which has just coincided with uh, you know the fact that we had a song called "Money for Nothing" on there, which was really about you know MTV. Um, yeah, there was a story Mark told about being in an appliance store and listening to some lorry driver. And he just wrote no, down no, the he words. was no, he was he he was actually he he was um he, he bought a house in New York at some point before that, and he he needed to get some TVs and fridges and washing machines for this. Day. I just have, I have this picture in my mind of Mark going into a white goods store and buying buying a washing machine. I think I've, I still find that image very very funny. But uh, while he was there, of course, he heard all the blokes looking at the TV. I, and I don't know who was on the screen. I think it might have been Michael Jackson or something. I'm not exactly sure. And uh, he just listened to these blokes and just wrote down an awful lot of what they were saying and then added a whole load of stuff of his own. And, hey, Presto, you've got a fairly extraordinary observation of what was going on at that moment in music. And you know, in the way that music was being spread around the world by television and by the digital revolution, if you like. Yeah, and uh, I guess I got off topic. I, oh, yeah. Why don't you, I think for people who don't even know, why can't you, why can you give us a thumbnail sketch of the roster of musicians throughout the years and the addition of other sounds? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, of course, as you as you rightly say, we were a four piece, really. Um, and uh, but when we were doing making movies, you know, obviously there was some keyboards was being, uh, you know, it, it being introduced into a lot of the songs. And um, Shelley Ackes and Jimmy Ivan had been playing with uh, Roy Bittan, uh from the E Street Band with Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. And um you know, they just they just have to say, well, you know, Roy Bittan will be able to handle this very nicely. Well, of course, of course, he could handle it very nicely. So Roy came in and played, you know, uh, a lot of keyboards on making movies, which, of course, it was for us. It was a big jump away from, you know, the first album and Communique, which was basically a four piece um, just playing the songs. I think there was a couple of keyboard chords on Communique, but not much more than that, which uh, Barry Beckett put down. But. So Roy got introduced into that, and then, um, and then of course on things like, uh, uh, well, by that time, then we had Alan Clark join the band as a member, you know, uh, for the tour, the Making Movies tour, and that's he and Mark worked worked through Telegraph Road a lot before it even came into the band's uh, arena of uh, um, energy and. And so Alan joined, and then there was oh my goodness, let me think, making uh, making moves, Telegraph Road. I think we had a few other people on that. Um, gosh, I can't remember now. I'd have to. I'd have, this is where I have to start going back through the through all the details on the on the album. Yeah. Sleeve. Um, right, right now I probably remember the book better than you do. You probably do, uh, despite the fact that I've talked about it quite a lot over the years. But um, you know, and Brothers in Arms, of course, you know, it was the introduction of uh saxophone and and percussionists and and such like and so you know a lot of uh i think manu Kache played with us on that and the brecker boys uh you know so you know suddenly we were working with the very best musicians in the world and it was a real pleasure to have them come in and work with us which you know this simple little rock and roll band from from uh, you know south london uh which obviously we, you know, we obviously made a bit of progression by the time they came to some brothers in arms. But 
Yes, it's, I mean, it's it's just wonderful to be able to have uh, great people playing with you. I mean, like, uh, you know, Jake Beccaro, you know, on the on every street album, for me as a bass player, yeah. to, to play with him was just sheer joy. I mean, he did. I think he did the whole record in three days. It was quite wow. remarkable the way he worked. And um, what, he had the a most extraordinary groove. So, yes, the joy of having other people coming in and playing and stuff and uh just wonderful wonderful uh, very blessed with all that one thing that that i didn't understand was even after you got popular you told stories about how after the concert you ended up with a as you would say a tenor or a fiver but it seemed like you were already popular so why would you even subject yourself to that or did you am i am i getting it wrong no that was the reality i mean you did get, when you toured in when you toured in in uh in the UK, when you know, for the first couple of years, I mean, you you go and play the Marquee Club in front of, I think one night we played to a thousand people, which was four hundred people over the over the required amount of people that were supposed to be there, uh, and we got paid eighty pounds, and the and the PA cost us fifty five quid, so I mean, we we literally ended up with fifteen quid, uh, between all of us between the. <laughs> For between the four of us, I mean, and that was you know, or and a pint of beer. I mean, it was really, it was it was absolute exploitation on a massive scale. If you wanted to play in these places, they said, yeah, you can play, but you're only getting fifty quid, you know, or a hundred quid or whatever. Well, by the time you've paid your roadie and the guy that does the sound and you've rented the PA, you've got nothing left, and that went on for quite a while. It was only really when we did the. Um, you know, when we started touring with with the Communique album, that there was actually some decent money in the pot, and then we could actually, you know, buy a, a car with four wheels on it. Um, now I'm exa exaggerating, of course. Anyway, when we, uh, when we when we were talking about music and art, it reminds me of the first chapter of your book, which is very lyrical, evocative, and almost like a painting. That first chapter. Talk about that when you were like when um, who was the band that was lying by the pool? I should know the uh, Ozark, uh, uh, Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Daredevils, yeah. 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 And you talk about that, and then you talk later at the same place where you meet Bob Dylan, and this is the guy who you've been revering, and then all of a sudden, Mark's working with him. But talk about that first chapter when when you're look you're out on the balcony, and Mark comes out and says, you know, here we are. Well, I think that, you know, we, it was that first American tour. Um, we were still, you know, we, we really, we didn't have enough. I think we got a little bit of support from the record company in America. Um, but we we had, I think we had three roadies. And of course, by the time we got to America, uh, the, the the single was number four or something. And the album was number two in the charts and we were going oh my god this is ridiculous and every single city we drove into it was either soldier swing roxanne or uh, breakfast in america i remember that so a little bit of a competition going on there and so we we suddenly realized that the band was absolutely becoming huge in america and we were playing in these small clubs and all the promoters said, no, no, we've got to move you into a big place, bigger places, you know, two, three thousand people. And we said, no, 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 no. We these all these tickets are sold out. We're going to do this tour and we'll come back later. And so the vibe in these in these like the bottom line and the Roxy and places like that was amazing. And the one you're talking about in L.A. was the Roxy, of course, which is world famous. Everybody's played there. And, and of course, the band, by the time they got to the rock, by the time we got to the Roxy was you know, was literally being played everywhere. So it was what you call a very hot ticket, I think, in America, to say the very least. So there was a, quite a lot of um, celebrity um, eyeballing going on by not just the audience, by also the band saying, my God, there's Stevie Nicks wandering out. And then, oh, there's, you know, there's Rod Stewart. And it was it was like, oh, my God. And we're still a little four piece from this flat in Deptford. Um so it was quite a moment. And then Bob came up to us in the bar upstairs and, and um, you know, said, uh, you know, that was great, guys. You know, you've got you've got some kind of sound there. I think that's what he said. And he said, do you want to come back to the hotel and I'll play you some songs? Well, I mean, that was 
I don't know what you say to Bob when he says, um, do you want to come back to the hotel and drink some whiskey and listen to some songs? Wait a minute. Yeah, all right. OK, we'll do that. <laughs> uh, and that was quite a moment. I, I mean, it was quite extraordinary. And as I say in the book, those songs have never seen the light of day. They were all brilliant. And he's probably just probably dumped them the next day and wrote some more. I don't know. But and then he then, he, of course, he and Mark got on very well and uh, went on to work together quite a bit and, uh, you know, became became sort of quite friendly, I think. It was funny the way you talked about Rod Stewart, like just turning around at the bar and saying, hey, nice. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a beer? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next time I, I played with him was at one of these you know, there's big uh, charity concerts in in London, and uh, he was he was one of the people who he, uh, you know was was playing with us. So um, yeah, yeah, and then the first one, which and you, and you portray this well because you say it's, it was tragic in a way, was Keith Moon. So tell that story. Yeah, well, Keith was you know as we know was 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 quite excessive. In his behaviour on many many occasions, and uh, he turned up at um, at the marquee. I think we we were doing what what we call a small residency. We were playing every Wednesday for about a month there. And by the last time, the the last Wednesday we were there, as I say, we had over a thousand people in the marquee club, which really should have held about five hundred. It was so hot that we almost passed out, and. Um, Anyway, we went back to the dressing room, which was probably about the size of somebody's normal bathroom, if you like, and uh, much worse than somebody's normal bathroom. And Keith came in with with his with his minder, and yeah. he immediately walked in and fell over, of course. And then his minder picked him up, and he and he said, uh, you know, it's, it, that was great, guys. I was going to fell over again. So this happened about sort of four or five times. In the end, he, he had to be just taken out because he was, you know, he was sadly uh, too worse for wear. Uh, thank God he had somebody who could pick him up and take him home. And then a few weeks later, he was he was sadly yeah. he was sadly dead. Uh, yeah, very, uh, tragic. I mean, you you think about it, you think oh, there for the grace of God, just back off a bit, and then you would have survived and probably become vaguely sensible at some particular point and 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 now be talking to you guys and you know about his life and and you think oh what a waste and oh that's what i can't stand about it this is why i hate narcotics because they're a they're unpredictable um you know and booze and all the rest I, I, you know, too much of anything just you know it's no good basically well, there, yeah and there's two aspects of your career that weren't chance well one was you guys had some maturity because you, know, you were already like kind of almost like a businessman and mark was a teacher and um a, a journalist so and you started late but later than most people in your mid to late 20s and also that you never did drugs well i mean you did some everyone did but you didn't you weren't addictive personalities yeah well, I didn't want to get into all that sort of just general sort of rock and roll lifestyle stuff because I've read so many books where it just goes on and on about groupies and drug abuse and drinking too much. And I said, so, yeah, OK, you know, that's what happens in rock and roll bands. I mean, let's just be honest about it. Uh, and I, so I thought I'd, I'd read enough about all that with other people. And I thought, no, there's just no point in doing that. But, um, I, you know, we weren't we weren't saints, I can assure you. Uh, and um uh, you know we 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 ha we had a good time uh but in our own way i mean you know because my way of thinking about it and the same with mark and i think this is why we made a good uh, pairing was because we figured that everybody who was coming to see us certainly towards the end and these were big concerts and made a fantastic effort to get to see you they'd spent a lot of money getting there it was a nightmare parking and these big stadiums are difficult to get into, difficult to get out of. So you kind of owe it to the audience to arrive on stage, at least, you know, pretty much sober, and play your gig, you know, roughly on time for two, two and a half hours. That's what, they, that's what they're there for. You don't make them wait for an hour and a half, you know, because you haven't got the balance of drugs right. I mean, it's like just, you know, go and do something else. I mean, just treat, treat your public 
actually with respect because they're the reason why you're up there having a very nice time and so there was just a few rules in the band it's not terribly boring but there was just you know i say to the guys look you can do what you like after the show but i want you here at eight o'clock you know tomorrow night stone cold sober and yeah then, you were always you were always on time and the other yeah. thing that you did which i don't know i i know the way you meant it and other people go oh it wasn't like that but you talk about the war and your dad and you talk about being you know being away from home for a year and your yeah. wife and your kid at home and then the other thing is you know you got up there sometimes being really sick and turning and vomiting into a bucket and the one time you got hurt and just stood up and kept on going even though you were yeah. bleeding yeah <laughs> yeah slightly insane but you know yeah. you know but if you but very honorable the only time, actually, if I'm right in thinking that a, ca a, a concert was cancelled was, I think it was in Luxembourg, when the promoter tried to save some money on staging. And we got a call from the crew before we, would le before we left the hotel to go to the gig to say, you can't do this gig. The stage is collapsing. It's, an, it, it's very dangerous for the audience. The PA on it is too heavy, which they put on there. The stage isn't capable of holding. You, you've got to cancel this gig. That was the only time that we cancelled. If you're ill, you play. If you've got the flu, you play. If you're sick, you play. Simple as. If you get cut, you play. You know. You did the other thing you did, which I would. I went. I was also thinking, why would they do that? You played in some really dangerous places where <laughs> you were. Why would you even play there if you did you know that it was going to be as bad as it was? What are you what, what are you what are you talking? Which place are well, you talking you're about? You're talking about the one with the Hells Angels in front of it, the one, couple that didn't have any security at all, the one where you were surrounded, you really didn't have a place, a curtain. And then yeah. it was in communist countries where they were rushing yeah. the stage and oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There was there were several of them, John. Yeah. Well, um, the Hell's Angels thing was the Paradiso in Amsterdam, and uh, we we didn't know that they were they did we didn't know they were the security until we actually got there, and this was in the uh, very it's a seventy nine I think it was, and uh, the, you know the promoter said tonight the Hell's Angels are doing the security on this on the stage. It was like okay, um, <laughs> not only did they do the security on the stage, they actually sat on the stage with us <laughs> and watched. <laughs> <laughs> and then came backstage and drank all our beer um uh but they were actually they were just they were nice guys they were just they were just making a point you know we're basically in charge and you don't argue with those guys really you know but i mean yeah that we did have some we did have some moments which were pretty edgy i must say um uh, the ones in italy i got ticked off by somebody actually wrote to me about the fact that i was you know, having a go at um, the state of security in, in Italy. And uh, I thought, you know, you, you're sort of undermining this, you're undermining the Italian, you know, this way of life. And I just thought, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you the way it is. I, you know, I didn't make that up. You know. It's hard. Somebody, you can't do it. You're not, my, allowed to do, you're not allowed to you know, do that. You're not allowed to sort of say that right. was a nightmare. Well, it was a bloody nightmare. You know, I mean, it was dangerous, and uh, yeah, you, know. you didn't have it. They didn't have any security. No, no. And the I only mean, the only security they had was the guys that took off their jobs and got in trouble later that they were in uniform. But they weren't <laughs> secure. No, the police. The police just walked away. They said it's your problem. You know, I mean, that was the talking about the actually it's the one in Milan where we'd already sold out something like thirty thousand tickets in this in this uh, indoor, not indoor, out, it was sort of like a big sort of mini arena in the middle of Milan, I about 30,000 people. And there was another 30,000 people outside. And the police said, you have to open the doors. And we said, we can't have to open the doors. Where are they going to go? It's already full. It's already full. And they said, the 30,000 people outside are causing a problem in the street. It's your problem. And we said, how is it our problem? <laughs> how is it our problem? And they, the police just walked away and ordered the gates open. So another 30,000 people came in. It was carnage. Absolute carnage. Scared the yeah. hell out of me. It was what, hell. 
But but two countries that were the opposite. One, which I didn't know, is that the Netherlands is kind of a test ground for was for British groups. And the other one, yeah. and we can get to art, is Australia and how you fell in love with it. And that's where you began to get your interest in art, your fascination yes. with it. That's your right. Love of it. Yes, I mean, um, yeah, I've got a big soft soft spot for Australia, I have to say, and and the Australians were very um, very keen on the band, uh, to say the least. So we we did a lot of concerts down there and in New Zealand. Uh, oh yeah, and, and you're you right play, about. Like, some... Sorry, go on. I was going to say some of your shows, like I, they wouldn't do it today, but you played like thirteen nights in a row. Uh, I think actually the the Sydney Entertainment Centre, we played twenty two nights there. That's amazing. Yeah, and we could have played another twenty-two, um, but it was you know it was it was a bit like um, going to going to work clocking on and clocking off you know with one of those ticket machines, but uh, it was it was great fun and we stayed at a nice hotel in Sydney and we went to the beach during the day and it was all very civilized and, and then just went for a, did a concert in the evening. I mean it was just like okay we'll just okay I'll, we'll see you at the uh, you know we'll see you backstage in a couple of hours and. Off we went and that was and that was where you met Brett. That's where you met Brett and yes, Brett, Brett Whiteley. Yes, I mean I don't know whether he's known in the states, but I think he probably is. Um, he did spend some time there. He lived in the Chelsea Hotel in in um, in New York for for a while. Um, now a remarkable character, one of those rare individuals that you will never meet the like of again. I mean. Uh, and he inspired me really to, you know, take another look at actually getting involved personally in art, not just buying it, but actually doing it. And uh, so that's, he was a great inspiration to me, actually. Yeah, and you portray his personality, almost like a split personality and following the band. And after, because I was so interested in him, I, looked, I started looking at his art and his self-portraits are like haunting. Oh yeah, no. Well, he was a he was a he was a he was a haunted man. I mean, he, he you know he believed that an artist should really push himself to the absolute extreme uh, in order to achieve some kind of enlightenment. And of course, he pushed himself once too many times to the extreme and uh, overdosed. Um, and he was only fifty eight, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I really miss him. And there's so many friends I've got now who would have loved to introduce him to because he was an incredible character. He was an extraordinary man and a wonderful artist. I mean, really wonderful. I mean, I've never failed to... If I if I show some people his work, they just go, my God, well, I'd never heard of this guy. I know, but, that's exactly what happened to me. And yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but the interesting thing you say, almost as an aside in the book, is that you think, and I think it's true, like whether it's Franz Kafka or Tennessee mm -hmm. Williams, you have to, you can't be, not necessarily be happy as an artist. You, yeah, it that's comes a, from somewhere in that. Yeah. You've got, sometimes you have to dig pretty deep in order to, um, uh, to find something interesting to say or to make or to paint or whatever. I mean, and sometimes, you know, when you're getting into a sense of despair, this is seen as being a shortcut. Uh, I'm not convinced about that, to be per perfectly honest. I mean, because having worked with somebody who's a consummate song songwriter, you know, uh, you know, if he's if he's if he's got a, if he's got demons, he's kept them pretty, pretty far away from being recognised. He's, you know, being a being a writer, being a, an artist is is an, is an observation, as I said earlier. You some people just have the ability to be able to observe the world, and you know rise above it in a sense. I think uh, Anais Nin, the writer, she said the role of the artist is to sort of rise above everything and look down on it and reinterpret it so people can see it in a different kind of way, and and make it more meaningful. And I think that. That's the great thing about storytelling, whether you're an artist or a, a writer, or well, artist covers all of that, of course. So we, let's talk about artists. And um, so it's it's a form of communication which some people have the ability to do and other people are not interested in doing it uh, or don't feel they can do it. Um, they say that everybody's got at least one book in them. 
Uh, I think I've done mine now, so I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to do another one. It always seemed like, you know, when you look back at it, whether it's you looking back or me, that you and Mark were fairly level-headed people. Maybe Mark compartmentalized stuff, but he was always low-key. And you would say, like, even if there was an emergent situation, he would just go, okay, whatever. And yeah. and um, I think that's what kept the band to- I would say that's what kept the band together. Well, it was, because it was just the two of you. Yeah, I think that I think it's you know you you need in some ways if you're a solo artist if you like it's more difficult. I think if you've got somebody else um, with you who understands what the deal is, and that's really um, a part. It's it's a kind of friendship, but it's also an understanding of uh, the role that people play in bands, uh, how to keep them together um and sometimes how they break apart as well of course but you know that's obvious but you know if you look at a lot of most a lot of successful bands it's not just one person you know jagger and richard for instance lennon mccartney um uh oh i don't know let me think if i I mean look at look at fleetwood mac all those people were integral parts of it you know okay it was a bit messy on occasions but you know sailor v and um, you know, you, you you're stronger together. Two two strong people are bigger than two people. They're sort of like three or four even because if you're like minded and you see the way that it, we should be going, and, and and you know, I was better at some things than Mark. You know, I was quite good at organising things in the early days, um, and you know, I I let him get on with what he did, and you know, recognised his abilities and 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 and. Uh, and celebrated them um as you know uh, but um so it's a t- it's team it's a teamwork really i mean it's like you you can't win a, a football match just with the center forward you know right well exactly and that's the, um and you also explained very well how the the bass and the drum is is kind of like the foundation um, yeah because it, it doesn't exist without that and no, um, you, you take that out you take the bass out of a track it goes Something's happened here. That's not good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, lo- I still love playing the bass. I mean, yeah, I, I was going to ask you. I've yeah, well, your some... music. Uh, talk a little bit about your music now, and what, and uh, and because you have an interesting band from time to time, which is completely yeah. different than it was. Yeah. Well, not many people know this, but I've had eight solo albums out now. My eighth one came out last year, and um, so I, I'm pretty much sort of putting ideas down most of the time sometimes quicker than others sometimes nothing happens at all but so i have to keep the iphone handy but so i'm constantly thinking about things of ways of 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 maybe writing something interesting and sometimes i don't really know i have no idea how it all comes together really i really don't but i love i love the 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 um excitement of of putting ideas together and making them work and i do love recording and I, and i love playing live so you know over the years eight solo albums you know probably 60 70 songs or something like that i've written um and uh you know i've been very happy with the with the response it's had i mean this last record actually has had the biggest response of all of them um i don't quite know why but maybe it's just uh you know coming of age i don't know but yeah, it's amazing. I, I love it. I mean, I'm I'm doing some festivals, some small festivals in this country this year. I did one on Saturday. Great, you know, four or five thousand people. Lovely, great audience, great band, great sound. There's nothing not to like, really. And yeah, you and I were talking before we began about how both of us were just 18, and I honestly feel that way. But you know, who would have thought that you would be? You would never, ever, even at the like Mick Jagger saying, "I'm not going to be singing Satisfaction when I'm 30," and uh, there he's 80 on another tour. But yeah, it's amazing that you can still do it and do it well, and your voice is still in really good shape, which is surprising. Amazing. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think nobody, nobody really thought that anybody would be playing rock and roll beyond the age of 40. You know, uh, uh, it's just it was it was it was seen as being a young, a really young man's game. And who would be interested in anybody over forty on a stage? But in fact, actually, 
you know, there's an awful lot of people now who uh, uh, who can continue to play right to the very end. I mean, which is fantastic. I mean, Jeff Beck was literally playing a couple of days before he sadly died, and Robbie Robertson and you know Tina Turner. I mean, we were all these people that we've touched in our lives, and you know, and they've all their their contribution to the world of music is is fantastic and still going on i mean the stones still please a lot of people you know uh it's it's it's, a, it's a, they they got quite good at it now they got they know what they're doing now i think <laughs> yeah i know i remember seeing them on the steel wheels tour and thinking wow they're really old <laughs> and now oh, yeah, well, wow they were so young then <laughs> yeah that was 20 years ago I at think. least by, it's probably longer than that john it's probably 30 yeah. years I That's think the happens. only thing that I find, you know, I mean, I did, I did, a, I did a festival uh, two or three weeks ago, and it was two and a quarter hours, and it was full on. It was a very hot day, and uh, you know, I, I, I sort of, I went back to the dressing room off the stage after one encore, and I sat down. and thought, Jesus Christ, that was exhausting, <laughs> and then you know, my PA, my my security guy came in and he said. You've got to go back on again. I said, I can't. I'm absolutely, I've had it, man. I've had it. And he said, just drink a bit of this vodka and then get back on there. So, <laughs> uh, oh. and, uh, but you know, it's, it's lovely and it's just fantastic. You know, I just, it's the only game in town really for me right now is to do some live gigs. I've got a great band. I've got a lovely bunch of guys and a oh. girl. Girl, girl, got a girl singing. Oh, yeah. I saw, I saw, I saw her singing. Yeah, um, she's a great singer. Well, anyway, yeah. So, so, yeah, I guess to conclude, that's a good time to wind down. Is that you're still not wound down? You're still going. Your book is at my bookstore, and you still have thank your you. music. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for doing this today. It was a pleasure talking to you and meeting you. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I always like to have a chat with people who love music. Yeah, it it really the book really made me happy. I read it, listened to it in one sitting. And just there were so many memories. It's just like you and Mark say that you've touched so many, so many lives. So I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I know. Well, we were very fortunate in that respect, you know. Yeah, we all were. Yeah, okay. Absolutely right. Okay. Talk well, thank you, you very much. Thank you.